Book six, Canto eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nathan at antipodeanwriter.wordpress.com. The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. Book six, The Legend of St. Calidore. Canto eight. Prince Arthur overcomes disdain, quits Mirabel from dread, Serena found of salvages, by Calipine is freed. Ye gentle ladies, in whose sovereign power love hath the glory of his kingdom left, and the hearts of men as your eternal dower, in iron chains of liberty bereft, delivered hath into your hands by gift, be well aware how ye the same do use, that pride do not to tyranny you lift. Least if men you of cruelty accuse, he from you take that chiefdom which ye do abuse. And as ye soft and tender are by kind adorned with goodly gifts of beauty's grace, so be ye soft and tender eke in mind. But cruelty and hardness from you chase, that all your other praises will deface, and from you turn the love of men to hate, and sample take of Mary Belly's case, who from the high degree of happy state fell into wretched woes, which she repented late. Who after thraldom of the gentle squire, which she beheld with lamentable eye, was touched with compassion entire, and much lamented his calamity, that for her sake fell into misery, which booted naught for prayers, nor for threat, to hopeful to release or mollify, for aye the more that she did them entreat, the more they him misused and cruelly did beat. So as they forward on their way did pass, him still reviling and afflicting sore, they met Prince Arthur with Sir Enias, that was that courteous knight, whom he before, having subdued, yet did to life restore, to whom as they approached they gan augment their cruelty and him to punish more, scourging and hailing him more vehement, as if it them should grieve to see his punishment. The squire himself, when as he saw his lord, the witness of his wretchedness in place, was much ashamed that with an hempen cord he like a dog was led in captive case, and did his head for bashfulness abase, as loth to see, or to be seen at all, shame would be hid. But when as Enias beheld two such, of two such villains thrall, his manly mind was much immoved therewithal. And to the prince thus said, See you, sir knight, the greatest shame that ever I yet saw. Yond lady and her squire with foul despite, abused against all reason and all law, without regard of pity or of awe see how they do that squire beat and revile see how they do the lady hail and draw but if ye please to lend me leave a while i will them soon acquit and both of blame assoil the prince assented and then he straightway dismounting light his shield about him threw with which approaching thus he gan to say abide ye caitiff treachetors untrue that have with treason thralled unto you these two unworthy of your wretched bands and now your crime with penalty pursue abide and from them lay your loathly hands or else abide the death that hard before you stands the villain stayed not answer to invent but with his iron club preparing way his mind sad message back unto him sent the which descended with such dreadful sway that seemed nought the course thereof could stay no more than lightning from the lofty sky ne list the knight the power thereof assay whose doom was death but lightly slipping by unwares defrauded his intended destiny and to requite him with the like again with his sharp sword he fiercely at him flew and struck so strongly that the carl with pain saved himself but that he there him slew yet saved not so but that the blood it drew and gave his foe good hope of victory who therewith fleshed 
upon him set anew and with the second stroke thought certainly to have supplied the first and paid the ursury but fortune answered not unto his call for as his hand was heaved up on height the villain met him in the middle fall and with his club bet back his brondiron bright so forcibly that with his own hands might re beaten back upon himself again he driven was to ground in self despite from whence ere he recovery could gain he in his neck had set his foot with fell disdain with that the fool which did that end await came running in and whilest on ground he lay laid heavy hands on him and held so straight that down he kept him with his scornful sway so as he could not weld him any way the whiles that other villain went about him to have bound and thralled without delay the whiles the fool did him revile and flout threatening to yoke them tow and tame their courage stout as when a sturdy ploughman with his hind by strength have overthrown a stubborn steer they down him hold and fast with cords do bind till they him force the buxom yoke to bear so did these two this night oft tug and tear which when the prince beheld there standing by he left his lofty steed to aid him near and buckling soon himself gan fiercely fly upon that carl to save his friend from jeopardy the villain leaving him unto his mate to be captived and handled as he list himself addressed unto this new debate and with his club him all about so blist that he which way to turn him scarcely wist sometimes aloft he laid sometimes alow now here now there and oft him near he missed so doubtfully that hardly one could know whether more wary were to give or ward the blow but yet the prince so well inured was with such huge strokes approved oft in fight that way to them he gave forth right to pass and he would endure the danger of their might but wait advantage when they down did light at last the captive after long discourse when all his strokes he saw avoided quite resolved in one to assemble all his force and make one end of him without ruth or remorse his dreadful hand he heaved up aloft and with his dreadful instrument of ire thought sure have pounded him to powder soft or deep embowed him in the earth entire but fortune did not with his will conspire for ere his stroke attained his intent the noble child preventing his desire under his club with wary boldness went and smote him on the knee that never yet was bent it never yet was bent ne bent it now albe the stroke so strong and puissant were that seemed a marble pillar it could bow but all that leg which did his body bear it cracked throughout yet did no blood appear so as it was unable to support so huge a burden on such broken gear but fell to ground like to a lump of dirt whence he essayed to rise but could not for his hurt eftsoons the prince to him full nimbly stepped and least he should recover foot again his head meant from his shoulders to have swept which when the lady saw she cried amain stay stay sir knight for love of god abstain from that unwares ye witless do intend slay not that carl though worthy to be slain for more on him doth then himself depend my life will by his death have lamentable end he stayed his hand according her desire yet neither more him suffered to arise but still suppressing gan of her inquire what meaning mote those uncouth words comprise that in that villain's health her safety lies that were no might in man no heart in knights which durst her dreaded rescue enterprise yet heavens themselves that favour feeble rights would for itself redress and punish such despites then bursting forth in tears which gushed fast like many water streams a while she stayed till her sharp passion being overpast her tongue to her restored then thus she said nor heavens nor men can me most wretched maid deliver from the doom of my desert the which the god of love hath on me laid and damned to endure this direful smart for penance of my proud and hard rebellious heart 
prime of youthly years when first the flower of beauty gan to bud and blossom delight and nature me endued with plenteous dower of all her gifts that pleased each living sight i was beloved of many a gentle knight and sued and sought with all the service due full many a one for me deep groaned and sighed and to the door of death for sorrow drew complaining out on me that would not on them rue but let them love that list or live or die me list not die for any lover's duel me list me leave my loved liberty to pity him that list to play the fool to love myself i learned had in school thus i triumphed long in lover's pain and sitting careless on the scorner's stool did laugh at those that did lament and plain but all is now repaid with interest again below the winged god that woundeth hearts caused me be called to a compt therefore and for revengement of those wrongful smarts which i to others did inflict afore a deemed me to endure this penance sore that in this wise and this unmeet array with these two lewd companions and no more disdain and scorn i through the world should stray till i have saved so many as i erst did slay certes said then the prince the god is just that taketh vengeance of his people's spoil for were no law in love but all that lust might them oppress and painfully turmoil his kingdom would continue but a while but tell me lady wherefore do you bear this bottle thus before you with such toil and eke this wallet at your back arrear that for these carles to carry much more comely were you in this bottle said the sorry maid i put the tears of my contrition till to the brim i have it full defrayed and in this bag which i behind me don i put repentance for things past and gone yet is the bottle leaked and bag so torn that all which i put in falls out anon and is behind me trodden down of scorn who mocketh all my pain and laughs the more i mourn the infant hearkened wisely to her tale and wondered much at cupid's judgment wise that could so meekly make proud hearts avail and wreak himself on them that him despise then suffered he disdain up to arise who was not able up himself to rear by means his leg through his late luckless prize was cracked in twain but by his foolish fear was holpen up who him supported standing near but being up he looked again aloft as if he never had received fall and with stern eyebrows stared at him oft as if he would have daunted him with all and standing on his tiptoes too seemed tall down on his golden feet he often gazed as if such pride the other could appall who was so far from being aught amazed that he his looks despised and his boast dispraised then turning back unto that captive thrall who all this while stood there beside them bound unwilling to be known or seen at all he from those bands win him to have unwound but when approaching near he plainly found it was his own true groom the gentle squire he thereat wexed exceedingly astound and him did oft embrace and oft admire and he could with seeing satisfy his great desire meanwhile the salvage man when he beheld that huge great fool oppressing the other knight whom with his weight unwelled he down he held he flew upon him like a greedy kite unto some carrion offered to his sight and down him plucking with his nails and teeth gan him to hail and tear and scratch and bite and from him taking his own whip therewith so sore him scourgeth that the blood down followeth and sure i ween had not the lady's cry procured the prince his cruel hand to stay he would with whipping him have done to die but being checked he did abstain straightway and let him rise then thus the prince gan say now lady sith your fortunes thus dispose that if ye list have liberty ye may unto yourself i freely leave to choose whether i shall you leave 
or from these villains lose ah nay sir knight said she it may not be but that i needs must by all means fulfil this penance which enjoined is to me least unto me betide a greater ill yet no less thanks to you for your good will so humbly taking leave she turned aside but arthur with the rest went onward still on his first quest in which did him betide a great adventure which did him from them divide but first it falleth me by course to tell of fair serena who as erst you heard when first the gentle squire at variance fell with those two carles fled fast away afeard of villainy to be to her in feared so fresh the image of her former dread yet dwelling in her eye to her appeared that every foot did tremble which did tread and every body too and two she four did read through hills and dales through bushes and through brares long thus she fled till that at last she thought herself now past the peril of her fears then looking round about and seeing nought which doubt of danger to her offer mort she from her palfrey lighted on the plain and sitting down herself a while bethought of her long travel and turmoiling pain and often did of love and oft of luck complain and evermore she blamed calapine the good sir calapine her own true knight as the only author of her woeful time for being of his love to her so light as her to leave in such a piteous plight yet never turtle truer to his make then he was tried unto his lady bright who all this while endured for her sake great peril of his life and restless pains did take though when as all her plaints she had displayed and well disburdened her engrieved breast upon the grass herself adown she laid where being tired with travel and oppressed with sorrow she betook herself to rest there whilst in morpheus bosom safe she lay fearless of aught that mote her peace molest false fortune did her safety betray unto a strange mischance that menaced her decay in these wild deserts where she now abode there dwelt a salvage nation which did live of stealth and spoil and making nightly road into their neighbours borders ne did give themselves to any trade as for to drive the painful plough or cattle for to breed or buy adventures merchandise to thrive but on the labours of poor men to feed and serve their own necessities with others need thereto they used one most accursed order to eat the flesh of men whom they might find and strangers to devour which on their border were brought by error or by wreckful wind a monstrous cruelty gainst course of kind they towards evening wandering every way to seek for beauty came by fortune blind whereas this lady like a sheep astray now drowned in the depth of sleep or fearless lay soon as they spied her lord what gladful glee they made amongst themselves but when her face like the fair ivory shining they did see each gan his fellow solace and embrace for joy of such good hap by heavenly grace they gan they to devise what course to take whether to slay her there upon the place or suffer her out of her sleep to wake and then her eat at once or many meals to make the best advisement was of bad to let her sleep out her fill without encumberment for sleep they said would make her battle better then when she waked they all gave one consent that since by grace of god she there was sent unto their god they would her sacrifice whose share her guiltless blood they would present but of her dainty flesh they did devise to make a common feast and feed with gourmandise so round about her they themselves did place upon the grass and diversely dispose as each thought best to spend the lingering space 
some with their eyes the daintest morsels chose some praise her paps some praise her lips and nose some wet their knives and strip their elbows bare the priest himself a garland doth compose of finest flowers and with full busy care his bloody vessels wash and holy fire prepare the damsel wakes then all at once up start and round about her flock like many flies whooping and hallowing on every part as if they would have rent the brazen skies which when she sees with ghastly griefful eyes her heart does quake and deadly pallid hue benumbs her cheeks then out aloud she cries where none is nigh to hear that will her rue and rends her golden locks and snowy breasts imbrue but all boots not they hands upon her lay and first they spoil her of her jewels dear and afterwards of all her rich array the which amongst them they in pieces tear and of the prey each one a part doth bear now being naked to their sordid eyes the goodly treasures of nature appear which as they view with lustful fantasies it wisheth to himself and to the rest envies her ivory neck her alabaster breast her paps which like white silken pillows were for love in soft delight thereon to rest her tender sides her belly white and clear which like an altar did itself up prea to offer sacrifice divine thereon her goodly thighs whose glory did appear like a triumphal arch and thereupon the spoils of princes hanged which were in battle won those dainty parts the darlings of delight which mote not be profaned of common eyes those villains viewed with loose lascivious sight and closely tempted with their crafty spies and some of them gain mongst themselves devise thereof by force to take their beastly pleasure but them the priest rebuking did advise to dare not to pollute so sacred treasure vowed to the gods religion held even thieves in measure so being stayed they her from thence directed unto a little grove not far aside in which an altar shortly they erected to slay her on and now the eventide his broad black wings had through the heavens wide by this dispread that was the time ordained for such a dismal deed their guilt to hide of few green turfs an altar soon they feigned and decked it all with flowers which they nigh hand obtained though when as all things ready were aright the damsel was before the altar set being already dead with fearful fright to whom the priest with naked arms full net approaching nigh and murderous knife well wet gan mutter close a certain secret charm with other devilish ceremonies met which doen he gan aloft to advance his arm whereat they shouted all and made a loud alarm then gan the bagpipes and the horns to shrill and shriek aloud that with the people's voice confused did the air with terror fill and made the wood to tremble at the noise the whiles she wailed the more they did rejoice now mote ye understand that to this grove sir calipine by chance more than by choice the self same evening fortune hither drove as he to seek serena through the woods did rove long had he sought her and through many a soil had travelled still on foot in heavy arms ne aught was tired with his endless toils ne aught was feared of his certain harms and now all wheatless of the wretched storms in which his love was lost he slept full fast till being waked with these loud alarms he lightly started up like one aghast and catching up his arms straight to the noise forth passed thereby the uncertain glimpse of starry night and by the twinkling of their sacred fire he mote perceive a little dawning sight of all 
which there was doing in that choir mongst whom a woman spoiled of all attire he spied lamenting her unlucky strife and groaning sore from grieved heart entire eftsoons he saw one with a naked knife ready to lance her breast and let out loved life with that he thrusts into the thickest throng and even as his right hand down descends he him preventing lays on earth along and sacrificeth to the infernal fiends then to the rest his wrathful hand he bends of whom he makes such havoc and such hue that swarms of damned souls to hell he sends the rest that scape his sword and death eschew fly lock a flock of doves before a falcon's view from then returning to that lady back whom by the altar he doth sitting find yet fearing death and next to death the lack of clothes to cover what they ought by kind he first her hands beginneth to unbind and then to question of her present woe and afterwards to cheer with speeches kind but she for nought that he could say or do one word durst speak or answer him a wit thereto so inward shame of her uncomely case she did conceive through care of womanhood that though the night did cover her disgrace yet she in so unwomanly a mood would not bewray the state in which she stood so all that night to him unknown she passed but day that doth discover bad and good ensuing made her known to him at last the end whereof i'll keep until another cast end of canto eight book six the legend of saint calidore recorded by nathan at antipodean writer dot wordpress dot com